This is the V41 Raven. And it's also the vehicle I've literally spent all of my free time this week crying over. From dynamically rolling over 20 times in a row, to fixing the cockpit and dealing with a whole slew of control issues, to dynamically rolling over another 20 times and fixing it again, this VTOL has taken up all of my free time to make, but featuring an easy to use control system and an unparalleled level of detail, I can proudly say that this is just about the first vehicle of its type ever in the new flyout. Here's why. Hey guys, it's M82 and today we're making my most ambitious project yet. And you might say, Bob Mess here, you made that like half a month ago with your Basilisk. Yeah, this thing raises the bar above that. Is it as fun to fly as that jet? Is it as potentially cool as that jet? Maybe, maybe not. I'd say that's subjective. But what I can say for sure is that the level of detail and complex control setup bar has been raised. This thing took me almost 40 hours to make, and I've been working on it since the week before to try and dampen that blow a little bit because I knew this video would take a long time, and I'm still behind schedule. So what makes this thing so special? Well, let's start with the objectives of this aircraft. As a part of my dedicated stock craft competition vehicle escapade, I wanted to make something a little bit less combat focused, as well as something that shows off what you can do with flyout as a whole. So for vehicle type, I settled on this. A quad tilt rotor. Pretty cool, right? The idea of this aircraft was pretty simple. I needed to lift ultra heavy payloads long ranges at a high speed and be able to VTOL in case you needed to land on a carrier or helipad or just in the middle of nowhere even. So let's say you wanted to deliver like a tank or humanitarian aid a very long distance and you don't have an airfield to land on. Well, that's exactly what this thing was for. Here's how I accomplished it. As mentioned before, the aircraft will have a quad rotor setup. This means the engines rotate, similar to the V-22 Osprey. For VTOL and hovering takeoffs, the engines stay vertical. For level, higher speed flight, the engines will rotate into a standard airplane configuration. Furthermore, in order to reduce the aircraft's profile and allow it to land in smaller spaces, the engines ended up being contraprop. This means that each propeller spins in a different direction, and you have two of them on each engine. This both reduces the required diameter and allows for more efficient lift since the air straightens out past the blades, as well as increases the incident for the second blade receiving the air, therefore making stalls less likely. Lastly, the cargo bay door, cargo bay size, and lifting capacity were all designed with one thing in mind, ultra heavy lift. With a goal of a minimum of 40 tons, this aircraft would need to carry over double its own dry weight. This means a good low speed lifting setup as well as a sizable cargo bay was an absolute necessity for this aircraft. Well, that just about concludes the basic goals of this aircraft as well as the basic construction. Now I believe it's time to get into specifics. First things first on this aircraft design was the control setup which was by far the most complex part. Originally, I started testing it with simple, single bladed engines to see what would work the best before moving on to contraprops. The number one problem with the controls would be the transfer of movement. Helicopter flight, for example, was pretty easy, with variable engine angle for yaw and variable individual blade pitch for, you know, pitch and roll. Controlling the aircraft in VTOL flight was easy. But somehow, I needed to design the aircraft to disable all those controls in level flight mode. If the aircraft were to try to steer itself with its engines in level flight, it could lead to some catastrophic stability issues. So for the control setup, I limited the blade pitch to 30 degrees and made the blade pitch increase exponentially with engine angle and forwards airspeed, specifically Mach number. This made it so once you were in full level flight, the blade pitch would essentially be locked at 30 degrees under nearly any throttle load. Any attempt to adjust blade angle through roller pitch inputs would be immediately cancelled out. This is because the 30 degrees pitch limit and the Mach and VTOL controllers are constantly arguing. The Mach and VTOL controllers want to push it past 30, but the pitch limit is keeping it at 30. Anything else sort of gets sandwiched in between those two controls and therefore doesn't do anything. The yaw was a little bit different though because the yaw worked on rotating the entire engine pod. For the yaw setup, the control surface simply damps with higher dynamic pressure. This essentially means the same thing with higher speed, the VTOL yaw controls simply stop working. 
All of this working together results in the aircraft's controls being relatively stable at any angle and speed. The only thing you need to watch out for is blade pitch under throttle. For example, you might know that a helicopter under a turn sometimes needs to reduce the collective a little bit. If you don't, your blade tips may stall and you could just fall out of the sky and die. Not very good, obviously. I believe in the helicopter world, it's referred to as vortex ring. But don't quote me on that, I am not a helicopter expert by any means. Like, actually, just a quick side note here. All these crashes you're seeing where I flip over, it's because of the blade pitch, and it actually took me a while to figure that out. It took me a while to figure out how to eliminate this effect. I more or less needed to make the default blade pitch like about negative 10 degrees or so, and just adjust all the controls little by little until you could fly it without rolling over under 99% of scenarios. Ultimately, that was the point of the control setup, was to make it as easy to control as possible for anyone, including the general populace who may end up flying this thing when the game comes out. And if flying it becomes easier and you need less training to do so, then we may be able to eliminate the dynamic rollover problems that the V-22 had and therefore make it more or less a better aircraft. All because our control setup involves basic fly-by-wire and autonomous blade pitch. But being honest, I would have killed so many test pilots. But essentially, we had the issue, we had to solve it, and then we had to solve it again later because we changed the engines, which ended up being a rather large disaster. To finish up this absolutely disastrous control scheme of the aircraft, I also included fully automated gear bay and cargo doors. This wasn't much by comparison, but it basically meant I had to set up extra control inputs for timing and autonomy. Just the icing on the metaphorical control scheme cake of this aircraft. For the rear door, a ramp would fold down where the roof panel would fold upwards. This allowed for extra vertical clearance in case we needed to load tanks. On top of that, a little panel would fold down under full extension and allow for an easier slope upon driving into the vehicle. As mentioned before, ultra heavy lift was a priority for this aircraft. The ability to potentially carry a tank or at the very least light armor was a necessity. Of course, that being said, I didn't need to VTOL all that way. You see, in real life, helicopters or V-22 Ospreys carrying an ultra-heavy load often don't take off vertically. Instead, they take off with a very slight forward movement, aka S-Tall. You can still land vertically, but that little bit of forward movement on takeoff makes things a lot easier for the pilots of the aircraft. So realistically, if I could S-Tall anywhere between 40 and 60 tons with this vehicle, and then vertically land it, of course, I would feel very accomplished with this. I actually learned a lot about being on the ground near helicopters from a server member and moderator. This guy, named Spaceon Server, has a decent amount of experience working around helicopters, for example securing loads to the bottom of them. While that wouldn't be the primary loading method of my helicopter, mounting points for securing suspended loads would still be included at the bottom of the helicopter. Something interesting I learned that needs to be considered is static charge. Helicopters build up a lot of static electricity while flying. While securing a suspended load, a grounding cable must be attached first in order to prevent the static electricity from becoming, you know, not static electricity and moving into a soldier or a person and potentially killing them. The next thing I wanted to consider in this design was exhaust blasts. Vehicles such as the V-22 have enough exhaust pressure, velocity, and heat to potentially burn or harm people underneath it when flying low. The V-22 has several other problems as well, including its dynamic rollover issues, which I aim to solve with this VTOL. First things first was the exhaust, however. The first modification to prevent this was a different TPR on the mechanical power turbine for the engines. Essentially, this thing had a TPR of approximately 0.05, meaning roughly 95% of exhaust velocity was converted into mechanical energy for their propellers. This would help with both exhaust velocity reduction and help increase fuel efficiency, ultimately lowering operating costs, which was a rather important modification. The real-life process of building this is a little bit different and isn't as easy as just simply setting a pressure ratio. So I can't really fault any real-life engineers for not having a tool like Flyout, can I? Next, however, was different. You see, the ultimate reason the V-22 burns things beneath it is simply because of how the exhaust is pointed. Most helicopters point their exhaust backwards, sideways, or whatever direction since it's a turbine mounted on top. The V-22 and this thing don't get that luxury as the turbine is attached to the engine pod, which rotates. 
And you might be asking, why not use a system like the one the V280 uses? Well, it's simple. I didn't figure out how it works before making this thing, and I'm not going to build it if I can't imagine how it could actually feasibly work, and at the very least try to explain it to you guys. I ultimately try to explain how these systems work at least to some minimal degree in every video, and if I can't do that, I'm not gonna make it. So instead, I went for what I'm calling exhaust diverters. Essentially, the exhaust is angled at about a 55 degree angle. This greatly increases the distance between the exhaust gases and the ground as well as providing a limited speed reduction, but that is the smallest reason this thing is good. Or at least the exhaust gas speed is reduced. Next, there were slats included in the exhaust that diverted them even further on landing approach. This component essentially almost like choked out the exhaust and made it significantly more turbulent when the air passes through. Presumably, whilst in landing configuration, the slats deploy even greater to ensure even lower exhaust velocity and disperse the heat into the air around it more effectively. Because of these modifications, I am hoping that it won't toast people in the ground while it flies by and that the exhaust slats should prevent people to the sides from being burned while it's on the ground, especially since they divert towards the front and back and more or less just reduce velocity entirely. This aircraft was also designed with a high visibility cockpit as well as a somewhat simplistic VTOL cockpit that hopefully has everything you'd need to fly. Not only that, but a full interior was built into the back cargo bay featuring jump seats, a finished cargo area, and even working drop doors and stairs to the pilot seats. So to explain every opening this aircraft had, we had the cargo doors, the drop doors, and an emergency escape hatch built into the front of the vehicle. I didn't end up recording all too much cockpit building footage as most of it was very inconsistent, but I did get to do some, and of course I plan on showing you guys that at the end. And then after that, all there was left to do was some basic external detailing work. Besides some basic run-of-the-mill instrumentation for the aircraft and some static wicks, a few other features were added. For example, this pair of simulated VHF antennae was added near the cockpit and sort of ended up looking like the aircraft had like little ears or antenna or something, so I actually decided to keep it that way. On top of that, multiple connection points for suspended masses as well as the ability to ground out your helicopter hopefully was added to the bottom of this vehicle. Last but not least to finish off the design, a wire strike kit was added to the bottom of the vehicle. This made it so in the event of a power line or guy wire or some other cable coming in contact with the engine pod on descent, it would instead run into these cable cutting devices. Such kits can be found on the front of helicopters just before the rotors as well as just before the skids. With that, the inclusion of lights for strobes, navs, beacons, landing and taxi lights, we were just about done with the exterior detail work. From there on, we decided to add, of course, a full camouflage, partially inspired by both V-22s and a KA-29 I saw, as well as riveted panels and basic weathering. With some better panels and rivets, a nice camouflage pattern, some lettering and finishing touches on the interior, including those jump seats and even that fire extinguisher all you guys saw earlier, it was ready to fly. This was the V-41 Raven what can only be described as ultra-heavy lift. Its top speed was a screaming Mach 0.4, over 500 kilometers per hour. Utilizing its high-power VTOL motors, the Raven could deliver payloads of over 64 tons. With its efficient engines, low operating cost and high range was expected out of every mission. With automatically adjusting blade pitch in a full fly-by-wire suite, flying a VTOL has never been easier. Efficiency, power, and range. 
the raven could do it all. All right, folks, we finally made it to the flying segment of this video. Most of it's gonna be time-lapse, so you guys get time-lapse messier the entire time today. Essentially, our mission is pretty basic. All we have to do is take off from our airfield here with about a 35-ton payload, which should be no problem for this thing. After that, we need to fly all the way over to a carrier we have sitting in the middle of the ocean. It's not too far out, it's maybe a, maybe a 160 kilometer flight. And from there, we shall VTOL land on the carrier, unload our quote-unquote supplies, and then go home. I'm not going to show the going home part, just the landing on the carrier, because that's all you really need to know. And while we're here, why don't we talk about some stats for the aircraft. So during the testing phase of creating this vehicle, I ended up flipping over, crashing and dying like about 40 times. Didn't show it all in the time lapse, because there isn't enough time in the day to see it all. But I'd say about 30 of those crashes were from the dynamic rolling issue. Maybe 10 of those crashes were from mis-inputs or just confused input controls, and that's, that's about it. You saw a few confused input control crashes at the beginning. Everything else from that point on was dynamically rolling. And, you know, that's actually what this thing does better than the Osprey, per se. Due to the automatic blade pitch adjustment, it's nearly impossible to dynamically roll this thing even under full power with a 64 ton load. I mean, you still can, don't get me wrong, especially with that full weight load, if you just go like 100% throttle, crank it in a turn, switch VTOL, you will absolutely dynamically roll it. But if you're flying this thing with any semblance of sanity, you will not roll it. And to give you guys an idea, that is a 64 ton vehicle. This thing could theoretically, has it has both the space and the weight capacity to carry either like an M1A2 with a full tusk package, a T90M, two LAVs, two Bradleys, or two BMPs, and all their crew and some extra stuff. With a carrying capacity like this, that makes our little Raven here just about the most proficient VTOL ever. With that all out of the way now though, we were coming in for a landing. I'll just let you guys watch this final segment here. I do hope you all enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one. I've done a lot of new editing tidbits in this video, and I want to know what you guys think about it. Tell me about it in the comments below. Do you think this video was more interesting than my other ones? Well, either way, folks, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for tuning in, and goodbye.